Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Modern War Institute and the International Affairs Forum event is War with China Inevitable, a discussion with Dr. Graham Allison. I am Major Nathaniel Davis, the Director of the Defense and Strategic Studies Program here at West Point and will be your moderator for this afternoon. Dr. Graham Allison is a man whom for many here requires no introduction, but for whom a proper introduction would be both lengthy and only touch the wave tops of what Dr. Allison has contributed, both academically and in practice to the fields of national security and defense policy. Dr. Allison is currently the Douglas Dillon Professor of Government at, Harvard, at the Harvard Kennedy School, was educated at Davidson College and Harvard College, earning a bachelor's degree in history, continued his education at Oxford University, earning bachelor's and master's degree with first class honors in philosophy, politics, and economics, then returned home to Harvard to earn his PhD in political science. He served as a founding dean of the modern Kennedy School from 1977 to 1989, and as the director of the Harvard Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs from 1995 until earlier this year. During the first Clinton administration, he served as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Policy and Plans, and has served as a member of the Defense Policy Board for seven Secretaries of Defense, and currently serves on the advisory boards for the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and the Director of the CIA. Dr. Allison has, has the singular distinction of having twice been awarded the Department of Defense's highest civilian award, the Distinguished Public Service Medal, first by Secretary Weinberger, and second by Secretary Perry. Dr. Allison's first book, Essence of Decision, Explaining the Cuban Missile Crisis, ranks among the all-time bestsellers with more than 450,000 copies in print and is required reading in any undergraduate or graduate political science or strategic studies program. His book, Nuclear Terrorism, The Ultimate Preventable Catastrophe, is now in its third printing and was recognized by the New York Times as one of the 100 most notable books of 2004. His 2013 book, Lee Kuan Yew, The Master's Insights on China, the United States and the World, has been a bestseller in the United States and abroad. And his latest book, Destined for War, Can America and China Escape the Thucydides Trap, quickly became a national bestseller and has undoubtedly been read by those in power on both sides of the potential trap. I have to admit, I'm one of Pro Professor Allison's uh, former students. When in graduate school, I took a course titled Central Challenges of American National Security, Strategy, and the Press, which at the time was co-taught by Professor Allison and David Sanger of the New York Times. The course was extremely interesting then, and given the contemporary world, I imagine that dynamic has only grown with time. This course had a weekly assignment in which we were tasked to construct a one-page policy memorandum on a given strategic problem. At the beginning of the next class, Professor Allison would call up those who had written the best strategies that week to present to the class. It just so happens that I've got one of those memoranda here with me today. Fittingly, the topic was the future of the U.S.-China strategic relationship. I was honored to be selected to present my thoughts on the future of the U.S.-China strategic relationship in class many years ago, and it is my great pleasure today to ask Professor Allison to come forward and present to you his views on the future of the U.S.-China strategic relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Graham Allison. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you uh, so much for such a generous introduction. And uh, he hadn't told me that uh, I knew that uh, he was a great student in the course. Uh, I had forgotten that uh, who had written the best memos uh, the week on China. I'm not surprised. Uh, I'm still looking forward. I'm going to look at it after to see how <laughs> we did. One of the things professors learn is that we learn a lot from our students. So for those of you who are students here, uh, educate your professors, uh, including me, we need it. Okay? And let me say how honored I am to be at West Point. Uh, uh, you folks are doing the nation's uh, work, uh, and uh, I honor your service. I, I teach my students at Harvard, as uh, you'll remember, that uh, George Orwell's line is one that everybody should, you know, remember 
often, which is the reason why folks like me and my family sleep comfortably in our beds in the suburb of Austin is because rough men and women stand vigilant around the world, ready to do violence. So that's you, and I thank you for it. So what I'm gonna do today is take about 20 minutes to give you a quick overview of this book, Destined for War, which I hope will interest you enough that you'll actually read it. Uh, and I think if you do, you'll learn a lot from it. The book, as was said, was published in Memorial Day, actually deliberately, and I wrote a piece on Memorial Day, which you can look up if you just go to the Belfort Center website, on avoiding unnecessary wars, in which I make the very strong proposition that many of the wars the U.S. has fought recently have been unnecessary wars, and we don't need another unnecessary war with China. So this book is not about fighting a war with China. This is a, about preventing a war with China. The title of the book is Destined for War, Can America and China Escape Thucydides' Trap? And uh, over the uh, what are four and a half months since it's been published, I've been very happy that it's uh, uh, become a bestseller nationally, that it's been widely reviewed uh, in all the relevant uh, places, uh, including a front page New York Times Sunday uh, review, that it's uh, immediately gone into the policy mainstream. So actually, if you watched uh, uh, what was happening in Beijing last week, Xi Jinping talks about Thucydides trap. Uh, so uh, it's uh, uh, actually, as Henry Kissinger said, the book provides a, a lens that you can use. So if you get the idea of the book, you'll have a lens that you can use, as Kissinger says, for looking through the noise and news of the day, of which there will be more and more, about China and the US, to the underlying dynamic in terms of what's happening, happening here. Uh, and it also, I hope, will serve to remind you that uh, history uh, can provide some perspective on what we're seeing th that uh, will be unusual, especially in a country that's sometimes called the United States of Amnesia. So I would say this is an arena in which you can distinguish yourself in being able to make a contribution by simply being able to have a little historical perspective in an environment in which the news shouts every day, unprecedented, never seen before, uh, et cetera, in which case those are mostly exaggerations. So if the book is successful, uh, it will, uh, and if, I, if I'm successful today, I'm gonna try to at least prick your imagination with respect to first, the introduction to a great thinker. Secondly, the presentation of a big idea. And then thirdly, I hope I'll leave you with a, with a uh, profound question uh, that'll be important as you think about your career next year and the next decade and, and beyond. So the, the great thinker is Thucydides. And as I've learned, uh, I presume uh, at the academy you read Thucydides, but I've certainly learned going around the US that Thucydides is a mouthful and that many Americans don't like multisyllabic uh, uh, words. So just so we're clear on three in unison, we're gonna say this fellow's name. Thucydides. Let's do it again. One, two, three. Thucydides. One more time. Thucydides. So you can call your mom or dad or uncle or sister or brother and say, today I met a great thinker. His name was Thucydides. They'll be impressed, okay? Who is Thucydides? Thucydides was the founder and father of history. He wrote the first ever history book, a history book about the Peloponnesian War between Greece and Athens in classical Greece. History defined as what actually happened without any interference by external spirits or myths or, or themes, just, just the facts. And Thucydides wrote this history, as he says, because since the future will more or less resemble the past, we can learn from the past so as not to make the mistakes in the future. That was his basic idea. 
So Thucydides. The big idea is Thucydides' trap. This is a term I coined about uh, five or six years ago to try to make vivid Thucydides' insight about what happened in the case of classical Greece. So you probably have read in your courses, if you haven't yet, you will, a famous, probably most quoted line in Western international relations studies. Thucydides wrote, it was the rise of Athens and the fear that this instilled in Sparta that made the war inevitable. So rise versus fear, bad outcome. Thucydides' trap is the dangerous dynamic that occurs when a rising power threatens to displace a ruling power. Think Athens as it impacts Sparta, which had ruled Greece for 100 years. Think Britain as it was impacted by a rising Germany 120 years ago in the roll-up to World War I. Or think China over the past generation and today in its relationship with the US. So Thucydides' trap is this dangerous dynamic. And in a, to put the phrase pointedly, when a rising power threatens to displace a ruling power, poop happens. Okay? So I look at the last 500 years. And in the book, I even give you in the appendix little short potted histories of uh, 16 cases that I find in which a rising power threatens to displace a ruling power, like Germany and Britain, for example. In 12 of the cases, the outcome is war. In four of the cases, the outcome is not war. So to say war between the US and China is inevitable would, on the historical record, be wrong. To say that the odds are against us would be correct. So when found in this dangerous dynamic, uh, more often than not, the outcome is war. And that's the dynamic we find ourselves in in the relationship between the US and China today. The, uh, the, the profound question is the subtitle of the book. Can America and China escape Thucydides' trap? And I think the answer is uncertain. Uh, and I'll say something more about it. So let me take the 15 minutes that remain to uh, pose three questions. I'll then first give you my tweet size answer in respect of Washington today. And then I'll say a little bit more about each. So the first question is, what has been the geopolitical event of the last generation, the last 25 years? the most significant geopolitical event essentially in your lifetime. 9-11 is a good candidate. We're going to come back to the answers. But 9-11 is a biggie. It's not my answer, but in any case, it's a plausible answer. Second question, looking forward the next 25 years, what will be the single largest geostrategic challenge for your career in service, what will be the biggest geostrategic challenge? And the third question is the subtitle, Can the US and China Escape Thucydides' Trap? And we can have a long discussion of each one, and I appreciate the 9-11 answer as one candidate. Another answer, if you go back just a little bit more than 25 years, would be the collapse of the Soviet Union. But my answer, and I think if you look at the evidence in the book, you'll see, my answer is that the biggest geopolitical event in the last 25 years has been the rise of China. Never before has a country risen so far, so fast, on so many different dimensions. As I quote uh, the former Czech president, Václav Havel, in the chapter on the rise of China, this has all happened so fast we haven't yet had time to be astonished. So I would say, if you haven't been watching China, the chapter I have, the first chapter called The Rise of China, will give you a jolt in 25 pages, at the end of which you should be astonished. So looking forward, the next 25 years, 
or as far as one can see. The geostrategic challenge, I believe, will not be Islamic extremism, will not be a uh, resurgent or uh, rambunctious Russia, will not be, will not be, will not be, but it will be the impact of the rise of China on the U.S. and on American sense of who we are and what role we play in the, ro in the world and on the international order that the U.S. built after World War II and has underwritten for the seven decades since then. And if I were allowed a few more characters in my tweet, I would say seven decades that are not accidentally decades without great power war. So you've basically grown up in a world in which great power war seems like it's obsolete. You know, we fight little guys. And in those wars, thousands of people die, or of Americans, but not tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. But that's an anomaly. Historically, you don't have seven decades without great power war often. Indeed, John Gaddis, Yale historian, wrote a famous article worth reading on this called The Long Peace, just explaining how anomalous this was. And it's not anomalous accidentally. It's anomalous because the US, after World War II, built an international order and has maintained an international order. But the answer to the second question is the impact of the rise of China on the US and our role in maintaining that order. And to the third question, can the US and China escape through Sydney's trap? My answer in the book is very professorial, so I say the answer is no and yes. Okay? So no, if we insist on business as usual, then we should expect history as usual. And history as usual in this case would be a war between the US and China, even though that would be catastrophic for both parties and would be judged crazy after by both parties. So business as usual, history as usual. But yes, we can escape Thucydides' trap if we take to heart Santayana's great observation that only those who refuse to study history are condemned to repeat it. So there's no obligation that the US has to make the same mistakes the Kaiser made that stumbled into World War I, or that actually Pericles made that prevented the sustaining of the, of the long peace. So basically, the hope, my hope in the book, is not to be fatalistic in any way, not to be pessimistic, but for us to be motivated to recognize that under conditions of extreme danger, extreme measures are required. And those extreme measures require lots more imagination than we've demonstrated so far, and lots more flexibility and adaptation than we've demonstrated so far. So those are my three questions and my short version of the three answers. Let me say a little bit more about each. First, the rise of China. As I said, never before, so far, so fast, on so many different dimensions. I've got a slideshow on this and some nice slides, actually a couple of them, in the, uh, in the book. Uh, the first uh, the, that I do for just if I were doing my slideshow is a picture of the bridge uh, at Harvard that goes across the Charles River between the Kennedy School and the Business School. I can look out my office and see this bridge. So the renovation of the bridge, the discussion of it began when I was dean of the Kennedy School, and I quit being dean in 1989. The project began in earnest in 2012. It was a two-year project. In 2014, they said it was going to take one more year. In 2015, they said it would take one more year. In 2016, they said, we're not going to tell you when it's going to be finished. Mm -hmm. And it's three times over budget. I contrast this with the Sanyan Bridge, which is in Beijing, which I drove across uh, two months ago. 
Sanyan Bridge actually has three more lanes of traffic than the Anderson Bridge, the one at Harvard. In 2015, the Chinese decided they would renovate the Sanyan Bridge. How long did it take for them to complete the project? So we take a guess. One month, six months, what else? 43 hours. 43 hours. So you go watch it on YouTube. You put in Sanyan Bridge or uh, 43 hours on YouTube. You can see a speeded up version of the construction of this bridge. And I can tell you driving across it, it works fine. So can you see this replicated in high-speed rail? US has one high-speed rail project. Where is it going from? San Francisco to Los Angeles. How long has it been going? 10 years. When was it supposed to be finished? 2017. What's the current completion date announced? 2029. And many people that I know think it will never be completed. In the same decade, how many miles of high-speed rail did China lay and that are operating today? 16,000. So you can get on the train in Beijing and go to Shanghai in uh, an hour and 20 minutes. If we could do this, I could go from Boston to, to New York in an hour and a little bit and to Washington in an hour and a half. So next time you go to the airport, think about that. You look at subways, you look at now, and in our space, look at bases. Look at ships, look at aircraft. How long did it take the Chinese to field their version of an F-35, and how much did it cost them? Excuse me, they didn't pay any R&D. They stole the design for free. Okay. Well, I guess they had to pay the thieves or the crooks, but in any case, cheap. Okay. And then they field them almost as fast as we do. And now they're fielding them faster. So basically, they are in the business of doing things in a big way. If you watched last week, big event happened in uh, Beijing, biggest, biggest event of the year for all of us, I bet, which is that Xi Jinping, the leader of China, was basically crowned the new emperor. I wrote a piece the week before giving my bets about what was going to happen in the Wall Street Journal. Again, if you go to the Belfort website, you can see a piece called The New Emperor of China. So basically, this guy is now running the show. And he's not running the show to make China more like the US. About China's going to become a democracy, he says, forget about it. The party is going to lead China. And who's the party? It's us, a small group of people. who are going to be more competent than the other people. We're going to be more energetic than the other people. But we're going to lead the economy. We're going to lead the government. We're going to lead the military. We're going to lead the society. And where are we leading? As he says, to a China that's going to be bigger and stronger and prouder because it's going to stand tall, first in the Middle East. So basically, if you haven't seen China in your space and in your face, either you haven't been watching or you should just wait. I have another slide in the, that I give to my students at Harvard. Maybe you'll remember where I questioned, it's a quiz. I say, when will China become number one? I have 26 indicators. And students have to fill in, 2030, 2040, 2050, not in my lifetime. And then I show them the second slide, which I have in the book, the short version, which says already. Okay? So most uh, biggest middle class, most billionaires, uh, most uh, smartphones, most computers, fastest uh, supercomputers, largest national economy. China has already eclipse the US in every one of those dimensions and 26 others. So this is the first time in the lifetime of folks like myself that the US has actually faced a competitor that will be as big and strong as we are. And I think the impact of that is hard to imagine. So to the second question, geostrategic challenge. As I say, it's the impact of China and a rising China on the US in every dimension. First is our sense of who we are. So for red-blooded Americans, and maybe even worse for red-necked red-blooded Americans, so that's like me, I'm from North Carolina. 
I know that somewhere it is written in an authoritative document that USA means number one. I think if you took my shirt off and washed the cosmetics off of my chest, it's probably written there somewhere. USA means number one. That's who we are. That's in our DNA. That's what we expect to be. So the idea that there's some other society, some other economy that's bigger than the American economy? No, I don't believe it. And you could see people struggling with the trying to recognize what you want to, you, in fact, you can't even read this yet in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Go to the CIA website and ask what's the largest economy in the world? China. Go to the IMF website and look, China. So measured by the single best yardstick, at least as judged by CIA and the IMF, in which they agree, purchasing power parity, China overtook the US in 2014. Well, that's not supposed to be. So the impact of this on our sense of who we are. In the South China Sea, we have been the arbiter of events in all of the uh, Western Pacific ever since the Battle of Midway. We've provided an international order that's been fantastic for everybody there. It was the enabler of all of the Asian miracles, including for nobody more impressively than China. But the Chinese have become uncomfortable with our serving in this way. Their view is we should butt out now. So if you look and see where the carriers operate in case of potential conflict, We've moved back behind the first island chain. Why? Because China's deployed so many missiles on land that can kill carriers. And will they push us back further? You bet. Okay. Well, there is a problem. Uh, uh, China's uh, relationship with uh, its neighbors in the South China Sea and ASEAN, it's become the dominant economic relationship the dominant export market, the dominant import market, the dominant investor, and they play hardball geoeconomics. So when the Philippines does something they don't like, they leave the Philippines bananas, the major export to China, on the dock till they rot. They say, we're inspecting them or whatever, whatever. Pretty soon, the Philippines get the message. So I would say the impact of the rise of China on the US has been huge and is going to be much larger. So this will be a challenge for us in every dimension as we think about it, and in particular, it'll be a challenge for people who think about the Korean Peninsula and our commitment to South Korea. So to the third question, uh, uh, can US and China escape Thucydides' trap? Thucydides taught us that the danger in this dynamic is not primarily that the rising power feels he's so big and strong, he's going to attack the ruling power. Or alternatively, that the ruling power decides, you're rising so fast, I better fight you now, because the more you're going to be stronger. Instead, what happens is, in the grips of this dangerous dynamic, third parties' actions that would otherwise be inconsequential or easily managed, become provocations to which one or the other parties feels obliged to react, which then requires the other to react, and that drags them somewhere neither of them want to go. So I have a good chapter in the book on 1914. You cannot study 1914 too much. Very important for you to try to get an understanding of. How in the world could the assassination of an archduke in Sarajevo as it turns out, by a Serbian terrorist, so you couldn't make this up in a movie, have provided the spark that produced a conflagration that burnt down all of Europe. So devastating that historians were required to create a whole new category. That's why it's called World War I. So at the end of the war, what had happened to the ambitions of every one of the principal actors and to themselves? So the Austro-Hungarian emperor was trying to hold together his empire. His empire is dissolved, he's gone. The Russian czar is trying to back his buddy, the Serbs. He'd been overthrown by the Bolsheviks, his whole regime is gone. Kaiser, 
is backing his only ally in Vienna. He's gone. France, bled of its youth for a whole generation. Society never recovers as an international player. And Britain, which has been a great creditor for 100 years, has turned into a debtor and is on a slow slide to decline. So at the end of this war, if there'd been a chance for a do-over, no single party would have chosen what he did. But they did, and the war came. So, to conclude, could Kim Jong-un, before you graduate, drag China and the U.S. into war? Absolutely not, you say. It couldn't happen. This would be crazy. I was giving a presentation uh, two months ago at the PLA Colonel's Academy in Beijing. And this young colonel raised his hand and he said, absolutely not. He said, nobody in China wants a war with the U.S. Nobody in the U.S. wants a war with China, so this could not happen. So I said, well, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, but I had heard that Chinese studied history a lot. Did anybody else have a view? So this other senior colonel raised his hand. He said, of course they could. They already did. That's what happened in 1950. So again, I have a little description in this book, and I would say you ought to look at it again for yourselves too. What happened in 1950? Did the U.S. want a war with China? Absolutely not. China wanted a war with the U.S.? Excuse me. We were, super, we were Superman. We had just dropped atomic bombs five years earlier to end the, uh, the, the Japanese war. North Korea attacked South Korea. We came to the defense of South Korea, pushed the North Koreans back up the peninsula. MacArthur thought the game was going to be over by Christmas, bring the troops home, unify Korea. Out of the blue came 300,000 Chinese, and then another half a million pushed us right back down the peninsula to the 38th parallel where we had to sue for armistice. Tens of thousands of Americans, hundreds of thousands of Chinese, millions of Koreans died in that conflict. And most of the Americans were killed by Chinese. And most of the Chinese were killed by Americans. So it seems absolutely crazy, but it happened. So for sure it can happen. Now, will it happen in this case? Well, here's the way the game's going to play out, and we're all going to watch. Actually, this is what's happening next week when President Trump is on the trip to Asia. Either Kim Jong-un is going to continue testing, including ICBM tests, which when he finishes the next round, or at least the one after that, so within months, he will have a reliable capability to attack the U.S. mainland with nuclear weapons. So nuclear strikes on San Francisco or Los Angeles. So that's either. Or President Trump is going to attack North Korea to prevent this from happening. Or there's going to be some other magical alternative, which I'm praying for. Okay? But it's hard to identify. At Mary Lago, the last time Trump met with Xi Jinping, he told them, you can solve this problem. But if you don't solve this problem, I'm going to solve this problem. And you're not going to like the way I do. Then he served him chocolate cake. This was the opening dinner. Went to the room next door and announced that we had just launched 59 cruise missiles against Syria. Just to underline how we would do it. So can Trump launch 59 cruise missiles against launch pads that will prevent North Korea testing ICBMs? You bet. For sure. He can. The question is, what is then Kim Jong-un going to do? And every time we played this game, he attacked Seoul. And when he attacked Seoul, we suppress all these artillery and rockets that can attack South Korea. Then we have the Second Korean War. So go watch Secretary Mattis' testimony. He's testified on this three times. And he says, be clear, this war is going to be catastrophic if it happens. We don't want a war. And the war's consequences will be catastrophic for Americans, not like any war we've seen in recent years. So this game is going to play out. Kim Jong-un could drag the US and China into war. To conclude, this book is not about forecasting the future. Indeed, I say at one point, the hope is to prevent such a future. I don't think it's inevitable that we let Kim Jong-un drag us somewhere where we don't want to go. 
But if we fail to understand that we're in a dangerous dynamic, we'll fail to stretch our imaginations to possibilities. And I think this is a great arena for the younger, both scholars and, and, uh, and cadets here, as you can contribute intellectually to the task of how we're, gonna, how we're gonna wrestle with this, because I would say Washington, as usual, will produce, unfortunately, history as usual. So maybe that's enough to stir the pot, and then we can uh, do some questions and answers. Dr. Allison, I'd like to begin by asking you to combine some of the concepts of uh, two of your books. In The Essence of Decision, you criticize the rational actor model while emphasizing the inputs of the organizational process model and the governmental politics model. Given your insights from Essence of Decision, what organizational and governmental factors would we expect to see in a potential contemporary crisis between the United States and China? Whoa, okay, good. Uh, good question, thoughtful question. And uh, would probably take a very long answer. Let me try to, to be brief, because I know I... Uh, so, uh, the easiest thing for uh, the U.S. to do, and for the de Defense Department, for the Army to do, is to prepare for scenarios that we can identify, and to find an adversary that we can feel, okay, we know that they're an adversary. Uh, so in some sense, my colleague Ash Carter is secretary in naming uh, both Russia and China as adversaries has helped clarify things. And I would say it helps to have clarity and it helps to plan against possibilities. But what, what I think we don't, don't have uh, and, and at a risk of not doing enough is having equivalent capabilities devoted to imagining alternatives uh, uh, and, and it, so to the diplomacy and even statescraft uh, dimensions of things. Uh, we're always, uh, I mean, I'm a Defense Department type person, so I'm more sympathetic for defense, but I would say still, I think the department brings more imagination to the party most of the time than, than the State Department is able to do or the other units. Now, the, the, the case that, that, that should give us some hope is, I think, what happened in the development of the Cold War strategy, where basically uh, a, uh, a, an a, a burst of imagination uh, in the period after Kennan's long telegram in April 1946 in which he said the Soviet Union is going to be a bigger existential threat to the U.S. than even the Nazis were. So that was like a crazy idea in April of 1946, and Washington didn't like it at all, but by 1950 had invented an economic strand of a strategy that included the IMF and the World Bank and the GATT and the trade and the Marshall Plan had a military dimension that had a standing military with a NATO and a NATO alliance, had a political dimension that was a, a, a commonwealth in effect of democracies. So I would say we're capable of strategic imagination, but that piece of it is likely to be le least well served. I think in the Model 3 story, again, uh, it's much easier to argue uh, against an adversary and to prepare to even to fight them, as crazy as that seems, than it is to say we should be adapting and adjusting and being imaginative and even accommodating in some spaces. So if you were to propose, for example, I mean, I think if there's gonna be a solution in the Korean case, it's gonna be Trump and she gets a couple of people to go sit in the corner and think of creative options that are gonna be ugly, ugly, ugly to bring back to them and then they'll look at them. But they'll involve the US compromising in significant ways. Mm. So can we adjust our military exercises in Korea? No, 
We have to have them exactly the way we want. Well, as compared to fighting over, eh, maybe we can. How, about, how many troops do we have to have in Korea? Well, I don't know. We used to have 300,000, now we have 28 and a half thousand. I don't know if there's a magic number. What about our uh, flybys and our, our, our sailbys of North Korea? Could we adapt or, oh, yeah, I think maybe. So I would say, but if you were proposing that in the abstract, it seems like, oh my goodness, you're appeasing these bastards. I mean, they're the ones that are the problem. We should just be you know, pressuring them. So I, th I think that the, the, imagine, the statescraft side of things, absent uh, 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 great states, men like George Marshall, like uh, Kennan, like Nitze, like Truman, like Vandenberg, you know, gets short shift. When I was at Harvard, I remember taking a course taught by a colleague of yours, uh, Richard Rosecrans, which was titled World War I, comma, World War II, comma, World War III, question mark. And uh, for those of you who are doing research methods courses right now, a question mark is a great indicator of a, quest of a research question. But I would like to ask you about what I think is probably the most single important character of your book, and that's the question mark. Could you explain a little about what you see as the significance of the question mark in your title and the strategic relationship that, or uh, strategic relationship could, that could likely dominate the careers of most of the people in this room and their role in it. So question marks uh, uh, in m most topics, I think as you dig in deeper, you start finding yourself with more questions than answers. And that's good because you're there, you're probing. And some of those are questions that people know the answer to. So it's just, I, I don't know, but I'm reading more and then I find the answer. So if the question is, well, uh, what, what did Thucydides say about the causes of war? The answer is, that's a, a fact. I can go and if I read in the Peloponnesian War, I find that he says there are three major motivations, fear, honor, and, sorry, uh, security, uh, interests, fear and honor. And then I have to figure out, what does he mean by honor, respect and whatever. Oh, okay, there's an answer to that. There are other questions like, uh, how likely was war between Sparta and Athens? And if they were able to prevent war for 16 years under the long peace, why did it break down in whatever it was, 431, over a conflict between Coursera and, uh, and Corinth. Well, nobody knows exactly the answer to that and you can dig further. Or similarly, as I said, uh, uh, how could the assassination of an archduke have produced World War I? I? I have a good chapter on it. I still don't know the answer, okay. So I think the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the subtitle of the book, uh, I can imagine it's now 25 years from now, or 10 years from now, even in, I can imagine one year from now. And the US and China are at war. And we're all gonna say, what? I mean, I, that, I, this doesn't make any sense. All we wanted to do, all Trump wanted to do, was stop North Korea being able to attack San Francisco. And everybody agrees that's a good idea. And so he didn't go try to change the regime. He didn't go try to attack the whole country. He certainly didn't attack China. He only attacked the launch pads. That was all it was. And he was hoping that would be the end of the game, which was possible. Maybe, maybe North Korea would stand down at that point. And then Kim Jong-un was only, in his view, responding proportionally. And then the South Koreans, so you certainly can't stand by and watch 10 or 100,000 people get killed in Seoul and not respond to that. And besides, the same artillery shells that rained down last night can rain down tomorrow night, so we better go attack those. But we didn't want to have a whole Korean war. 
But then once we went after a couple of thousand aim points, they thought we were at war with them. And so they began marching south and, well, we don't want to do this over and over. And we began marching north and we told the Chinese, we have no intention of bothering you. This is not about you. This is only about these bastards that attacked us. So, but they say, we already taught you this lesson in 1950. And we, we were only 150th your size. So we told you, no, the answer to this is no, you're not gonna have a unified Korea. That's an American military ally. And if we want to fight about it, bring it on. So the, you would just say, well, this is insane. So I can imagine that happening. I can also imagine, and I pray that what will happen is that uh, the parties will recognize that there's a danger that this erratic character, Kim Jong-un, drags us where we don't want to go, and they become imaginative. And lo and behold, we discover that, uh, I mean, what would be a better thing than if Trump comes out of this meeting with Xi and they say, you know, we've just simply decided enough is enough. This guy's not going to jerk us around anymore, and we're going to jointly work out a way to deal with them. And we will think of five ways. And they won't be our favorite way, but they'll be good enough. I would say I would cheer. Yeah. Let's turn to the uh, audience now for questions. Down here in front. Sir Cadet Armstrong, uh, in your book you talk about China as the biggest player in the history of the world. And, and you refer to this world order that the United States constructed at the end of World War II. Can you talk to us about how if we thread the needle, if we avoid war with China, how does that world order change? So how does the world order evolve? Yes, sir, if we avoid war with China. Mm -hmm. So a very good question. Uh, so. Uh, Henry Kissinger has written a, a very interesting book that I'm sure you've looked at on world order. And even the concept is itself a bit fuzzy. Uh, what, does it, you know, what does it mean? I mean, in orderly for some, in some respects and not others. So for sure there's not been a great power war for seven decades. So that's a big deal, for sure. Uh, and then we could do some other elements of this. Well. Over those seven decades, the first four of them were basically the Cold War, where we had a serious competition between the Soviet Union and the US. And while most of you are now uh, too young to even be able to believe, but if you were uh, a cadet here in 1961, when John Kennedy became president, he thought the Soviet Union might overtake the US in a decade or two. So the Soviets looked like a serious threat. And they were a serious threat in many, many dimensions. This turned out, fortunately, ultimately, their economy failed. And that then undermined the rest of the story. Plus, they had an ideology. I mean, they had the internal contradictions built in. But I think the, uh, so even over these seven decades, with respect to the most important dimension of order, it's changed and evolved. But the good news about it is, well, in any case, not a great power war. So, but there hasn't been in that environment another power that's as big and strong as we are, or at least as big and strong as we are in a region, Asia. So I think you could make a deal with Xi Jinping for 50 years that says, okay, he could even see in the speech that he gave last week, he's at least, he's heard of the Monroe Doctrine. And so he kind of thinks, well, look, you have your hemisphere. Maybe I have my space over here. And, you know, we, but the Americans are not about to leave Asia. Well, we're, an, as, as President Obama said, we're an Asian country. We have Hawaii. We're not giving back Hawaii. Guam is American territory. We're not giving back Guam. Uh, the Pacific is a place where we operate. We're not you know, uh, ab abandoning the Pacific. Japan and South Korea and Australia are serious allies, we're not walking away. So uh, how then does that order work where you have two powers 
that are of relatively equal size. And we will have a military advantage, fortunately, for a decade in some arenas and two decades in some arenas. And I wish for as long as, you know, as the longer the better as far as I'm concerned, but we can't count on just being more, having more resources to throw at problems. We'll have to be smarter about it. So I think it's a great question, and I think it's very uncertain how it evolves. But I think the, the thing to keep in mind is never, never, never to take uh, for granted the absence of great power war. History is a history in which great powers have found ways to find themselves in conflicts. And the 20th century was all about uh, two world wars and almost a third one. And if their third one had occurred, we might not even you know, be here discussing this. I think we have time for one more brief one. Number two. Sir, Cadet Hannon Company H2. You touched briefly on the South China Sea and with China occupying the uh, Spratly Islands and harassing Filipino shipping boats. How, what, what way do you propose that the U.S. address that while maintaining the alliance with China and their North Korean policy? Okay, it's a good question. The South China Sea. So, uh, and it's a long and complicated one. I think you could, we, we will watch over the next several years whether uh, basically the South China Sea becomes a Chinese Caribbean, more or less, and the countries in uh, adjacent become essentially uh, deferential to China. That's theory one. Or theory two, uh, there's sufficient pushback and maybe even potential for a conflict. And uh, I think it's very uncertain which of these is the case. I think actually many Australians who've been very, they're, they're there in the neighborhood, they watch very carefully, think the game was over, and theory one is gonna be the, be the outcome. Uh, now, if you say, well, what do we care about in the South China Sea? Other than freedom of navigation for all ships, uh, commercial and military, uh, when I do my analysis of vital interests from the US perspective, uh, yes, we have a bunch of vested interests there. Uh, we have a, a, a relationship, an alliance relationship, though the terms of it are a little fuzzy with the Philippines. And we have uh, been building relationships with all the countries in the region. And we've been trying to build an Asian order. And we've been trying to support ASEAN as it does that, to have rules for everybody. But uh, how much do we care about whether somebody builds an island or not, or who owns the Spratleys or occupies them? I mean, enough to fight about it? So I think this is gonna be played out just like that. And I suspect that if one ends up with some uh, adaptation and accommodation, that uh, China will be recognized increasingly as the predominant power in the South China Sea. Actually, in the book, I close the first chapter with the uh, story that was told by a great American diplomat, now deceased, but a colleague of mine, Steve Bosworth. Steve was the dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy after a long career in the Foreign Service where he was U.S. Ambassador to the Philippines and also to, uh, to South Korea. And he was appointed by Obama he had, he had been all over Asia for his whole career. He then became dean of the Fletcher School and was concentrating on that for 10 years. Then Obama asked him in 2009 to be the special envoy for North Korea. So he took a trip out there to the whole region and he went to each, each country and talked to people for, uh, you know, the, the prime minister or the president. And he said this was for him a Rip Van Winkle moment that when he had left 10 years earlier, the first country to which every one of these capitals would look uh, if there was an issue was Washington, first place. And the first place they would call was Washington. And that today, in every one of them, the first country they worried about 
And the first one they thought about was China, and the first call they would make to would be to Beijing. So I think that's some part of the, of the shift in gravity. Well, I'm sure there's questions that we'll be asking about this for possibly the next 50 years. Unfortunately, our time for today is at an end. So if you would join me in thanking Dr. Allison for coming today. And this concludes this event. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we got